And I'm joined today by Coach Jason Smelzer from the University of Central Oklahoma. Jason, thanks so much for joining me. I, I know we haven't talked in person for, for many years, but we once were at a university together, and it's great to, to have you on the broadcast. Tell us a little bit about, uh, if you will, about uh, where you came from and, and where you are now. All right. Right now, uh, right now I'm at University of Central Oklahoma. <clears throat> I am the linebackers coach and strength conditioning coordinator for football as well as women's track and field um, at the University of Central Oklahoma. Um, we came to Central Oklahoma from Henderson State University, where you and I had uh, worked together. In fact, I think I was on the committee that hired you. If oh, really? I, yeah, I think so. And uh, I was telling my wife about that this morning and uh, um, real impressed, by the way, um, with what you have done. And then um, prior to that, I was at uh, – Concordia University as a defensive coordinator, head strength coach, and director of athletic operations, which <clears throat> that's a big job. And, and uh, you know, I, I had to get out of there pretty quick, but uh, because of all the responsibility that we had. Um, and then prior to that, I was at um, Iowa Wesleyan College, home of the Air Raid, How Mummy, Mike Leach are big names that have, have been involved there. Um, I worked in the same offices. That place hasn't changed since the eighties. Um, it was a, it was a great experience for me and my family. We were there for five years and then our alma mater, both my wife and I, uh, we came from Southern Arkansas university where we both went to undergrad and we went to grad school there. Um, and then I was hired full time. So probably spent a total of my life, 10 years as an undergrad graduate and full time employee at the university. So that's a little bit about where we've been. You have, you mentioned two responsibilities at UCO, kind of um, doing the, the strength and conditioning for for multiple teams and also being a, an assistant football coach. That's that's a challenge. How do you how do you juggle or how do you prioritize how you work on those two different jobs? Yeah, that is what I talk to our kids about a lot and how to stay motivated, how to give tremendous effort and everything that you do um, is all about living in the now. And yes, we do have to have plans for the future and we have to have a planner and we have to know what's coming up. But I concern myself with now, hey, I've got a wait session at nine o'clock. Here's what I've got. I'm not worried about what I've got at 10 o'clock until that wait session is over. When that wait session is over with, all right, 10, here's what I've got. And I'm aware of what the schedule looks like prior to that day but I cannot focus on what's going on a week from now, what's going on a day from now, or what's going on a month from now. Um, if I do that, I'll lose my mind as far as how much work I have to do. So I'm an guy um, and try to work on, um, you know, just staying focused on the task at hand. And, and I've, I've found a lot of success in, in personal life of being able to do that along with handling um, the emotional stress of, constantly moving and the high, you know, the, the high pressure of the job um, and along with the, the physical stress too, as well. Yeah. I want to come back to that in a little bit, but you, you know, you've, you've moved to multiple jobs. It's part of a, a coach's life to a large extent. You've been at UCO now for, for seven years. How do you, uh, how do you balance the, the amount of hours you have to put in at the job versus, you know, spending time with family and just having time off? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> it's one that I struggle with because you love what you do. Yeah. And in, in, in essence, um, you you are putting your family on the back burner. I mean, your day starts out at, you know, getting up at five and being at the office at six. Um, you might not get home during the season till 10 30, 11 o'clock at night to start that process all over again the next day. So, you know, basically living roommates, um, passing ships in the night, you know, at, at times, um, trying to make the best memories that you can during the free time that you have. This is a great opportunity for us, all of us, you know, in this coaching profession um, with uh, COVID-19. I mean, we're at home. 
I mean, our families are here. We're working. But at the same time, I can get up and walk into the next room and say, hey, you know, to my wife, Wendy, hey, baby, what do you what do you got going on here? You know, are we going to eat lunch? What, what are you know, what are your plans? How you want to go for a walk and uh, be able to spend that time with her? And then my kids, I've got a daughter that's at OU. She's a sophomore. Um, she's at home now. So God's kind of blessed us with a full family back for however long that we have. And it's best just to enjoy the moment going back to, you know, what, you know, what my philosophy is on how to attack a day. It's what are, where are we at in the moment? Here's where we're at in the moment. And so let's work this moment right now, the best that we can. And maybe it's something we remember for the rest of our life. You, you talked about the stress of the job and, and the high pressure environment and you're very, a public figure because especially as a, a football coach, how do you, what strategies do you have to help deal with that? Because it's, it's, it's not like stress isn't going to be there. It's, it exists, right? The anxiety exists, the pressure exists. How do you moderate it so that it doesn't get the better of you? That that's a, uh, that's an ongoing process that, <laughs> that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm dealing with, but my sister is a, uh, She's pretty, she's pretty special. She's a uh, physical therapist, doctor of physical therapy. Uh, she's got her own clinic uh, down in uh, Coppell, Texas, down there in the suburb of Dallas. And uh, anyways, her and I were talking the other night and she was talking to me about the autonomic nervous system, um, mm -hmm. sympathetic and parasympathetic and how it controls the whole show. Um, and, you know, going back to the time that we're at with COVID-19, is a great opportunity for us to reset, you know, the parasympathetic system and the autonomic system um, by breathing, um, exercise, and and Tim, just you know, every day, regardless if I'm in the office or not, from twelve to one is my time. All right, I mean, I will get very angry at people that interrupt my twelve to one time. That's my lunch break, but I I take my lunch to work, so I go work out from 12 to one, you know, whether it's in the student union or whether it's in our own facility. And I will, I will change those up both uh, back and forth. Sometimes when I work out in our own facility, kids will see me in there, they'll walk in, they'll ask me a question, they're interrupting my time. Um, when I go up to the student union, no one interrupts me, you know, and, and I will do things, um, you know, earbuds in, you know, hoodie over my eyes, make no, make, make no eye contact just so, um, I'm not interrupted in my time, but I think it's important for everyone to have a time mm -hmm. uh, for themselves during the course of the day. And then when I get back to the office and I go back to work, I'm pull out my lunch, eat and multitask at the same time. But I think exercises is, is vital in the physical health of, you know, being resilient towards, um, you know, maybe some viruses that we have going around being resilient towards sickness and, and that type of stuff. Now, the mental aspect of things is a totally different, totally different deal. And that's something that I'm continuing to search, you know, with with the autonomic nervous system talking about that and, you know, parasympathetic, sympathetic ways to reduce. In fact, I'm doing kind of an anecdotal research right now on my resting heart rate and trying to find out where it's supposed to be. I'm laying on the couch, haven't done anything all day. And I look at my resting heart rate at 82 but that's, that's with a staff meeting coming up mm -hmm. in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? The day before it was 72. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the stress of the job, it creates undue stress, regardless if you realize it or not. I felt like I was calm and I look at it. So, um, you know, it's something that people need to look at with themselves, how to reset the autonomic nervous system just to give you that mental um, resiliency, you know, the emotional resiliency for the job. Well, if you're watching and you have a question, just put it in your chat box and, and I'm sure coach would be happy to answer that way. I'm not asking all the questions. Could you take us through a, like a typical day? Obviously we're, we're not in a typical world right now with, with the virus, but take us through a typical day of, you know, when do you get up? What do you do throughout the day um, to just give an understanding of w what it looks like for you? I'm a very structured individual. So the same things have to happen 
through the course of the day. So it's it's very important to for me to wake up on time, you know, not to hit the snooze button, um, you know, not to to disable my alarm and or to make sure that I'm very, um, uh, you know, whatever the word I'm looking for about setting my alarm and setting another alarm to make sure that I don't miss it. So anyways, um, wake up and then shower. Um, I blend every morning, um, fruits, vegetables, a little bit of protein in there along with coconut water, um, to get my day started off, right. Take my multivitamins and then eat a bowl of, uh, of oatmeal. Um, I'll have a cup of coffee on my way to work and that day starts. My alarm clock goes off at five o'clock. Um, I'm at work by six. I only live seven minutes from the office, which is great. And so um, at the office at six, first wait session usually starts at, at, at seven o'clock. So six thirty, I'm getting prepared. Um, a graduate assistant comes in. I fill her in on what we've got going on that day. If we haven't talked about the day before, usually we talk about the day before. So we can just jump in the office and, and hit the ground running. And then we start our, our day at seven in the weight room at, at eight o'clock. I have another weight session. Usually women's track and field comes in at eight. So we're already in there ready to go waiting for women's track and field. Women's track and field comes in. We give the workout to them, try to give as much energy as we can and positivity to the girls. And, uh, and then at nine, uh, when that weight session is in, I go directly to a staff meeting. Um, coaches staff meeting usually lasts around an hour, sometimes a lot longer, depending on what needs to be discussed, depending on what part of the season recruiting meetings, obviously will last a lot longer than an hour. Um, in season meetings usually last 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the day. And then from there, I go to a defensive staff meeting. Um, that defensive staff meeting will last um, usually up to around 11 o'clock. If, if I'm not in that meeting, then I'm in my office handling my responsibilities till 11, 11.30. From 12 to 1 is my free time where I lift. And then 1 o'clock is red shirt freshman lift. So all my red shirt freshmen come in. I grind those dudes out in the weight room. And, uh, and then at two o'clock, um, I let them go and go directly to a special teams meeting at two twenty, I go to a position meeting, which I hold for linebackers at two fifty. that meeting ends at three Oh five. We're on the field practice starts. Um, that practice goes from three Oh five to roughly five 30, 545. At that point, I leave the field. I go home, I grab a bite to eat. That's one hour I've got. And then I come back to the office and we're doing defensive film work uh, till it's time to leave, which could be um, 10, 10, 30, 11, whatever. Well, I've never slept at the office. So, um, you know, that's kind of how a normal day goes. Um, it's action packed. So that's why you have to stay on task with what is next. You know, what's important now? You know, not if I look at an entire day like, you know, I just described, um, I don't know mentally how I would be able to to go about it. But uh, if I look at it as one event at a time, it makes it more uh, it makes it a lot easier for me to conceive being able to do it and giving the energy that I need. Yeah. Uh, by the sounds of it, you're not getting much sleep. Well, I'm trying to get and I and I get I mean, I come home, I shower and I go to bed fairly early. So it's around seven hours is, okay. is what I'm getting on an average. Okay. But Anything I, less than that, I'm not I'm not very functional at less than seven hours. Well, we had we've got some questions for you. And, and one of them comes from uh, Michael Potts. He says, hey, coach, <clears throat> former student of Potts, you misspelled my name. Bag hurt here. Um, I was not a college athlete, but I enjoy sports. I'm looking for a career as a teacher slash coach. What are your thoughts on hiring coaches with limited playing experience? Well, that's a good question because, I mean, I, I, I have right now with me a graduate assistant and, and she does our nutrition and uh, she also does strength training for football and track and field. She was not a college athlete. It's a female. And she obviously didn't play football. So she's limited in her knowledge of the game. 
but she's not limited in her knowledge of the other things that she brings to the table. She's way better than me. And we had this conversation before this started about hiring people and sometimes hiring people that are better than you at certain things. She's better than me with organizations. She's better than me at, uh, at, uh, nutrition by far. So she does our nutrition, uh, the, a whole nutrition presentation. She handles all of our, all of our performance nutrition stuff. Um, so it's really about finding something that you're good at. All right. And it really doesn't matter about, I mean, it go get some experience in coaching. That's the important thing. No one really cares about where you play, what kind of player you are. I mean, I don't think my kids even know the kids I coach, even know I played college football. Maybe they do, but, but they don't care about it. They don't care if I was a good player and they don't care if I played in the NFL. It doesn't really matter to them. Um, what matters is what can I do to help them? Mm-hmm. So bring something forth to be able to help people. I mean, I look at people like Lou Holtz. I don't even know if Lou Holtz played college football. He didn't look like he played college football, but um, <laughs> you know, I mean, there are great coaches out there that I'm sure that that didn't play. So, you know, just, just get some experience in coaching. Okay. Good answer. And we already, we already kind of touched on this, but I want to at least mention it. This is Nathaniel Lucas. He, he actually was a guest on our show a, a few days ago. He said, thanks for sharing. What are some strategies you use to make sure you're able to sneak in your own training, physical and mental? As coaches, we're always demonstrating on our feet and managing stressful situations. How much of a priority should it be for young coaches to figure out a routine they can implement to maintain their own health? Yeah, Nathaniel, that's a great question. That's a very important question. I think that you have to look at your schedule and you have to devise a time that this is my time and it's the same time every day. For me, it's from 12 to 1. That is my time. And I mean, I'm, I think the other coaches on staff are very aware of that time is my time. The players are very aware that that's my time. Um, I, I, I don't let people interfere with that. Um, you know, that is the time where I get in there and I'm able to lift, take care of, 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 and I'm, I'm really structured about it. And I like to do it by myself. I don't like to have a partner because there are things that I want to work out mentally too. You know, um, I may have a conversation, um, out loud. People might see me walking around having a conversation, um, just problem solving, um, uh, expressing anger in certain situations, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes just motivating myself to have a better day in the weight room. So, um, you know, I think those are key in your mental and physical health is making sure it's a set time every day, make sure people are aware of that time and, uh, and be very stingy. If there's a time I can be stingy is from 12 to one. That's my time. Everybody else, my wife has her time. Players have their time. Coaches have their time. Coordinators have their time. Well, what about my time? You know, and, and I'm going to be um, very strict about, you know, my time. I want to change tracks a little bit and ask about recruiting. Are you involved in recruiting for, for the Broncos? I am. I am. So, can, you, can you give a little kind of overview of, of how that works, what your schedule looks like, what kind of players you're looking for? When do you visit somebody versus just have a conversation with them? Because obviously there's expense involved as well for the team. In the program so you know if, if somebody's watching and, and it's looking either to recruit or be recruited how how would they how would they be attractive to to a program like the broncos all right first of all if you're looking to be recruited the best way to be attractive to you know coaches is to do what your coach asks you to do at your high school it's not to go out and get an, an agent or hire a recruiting service Um, those emails I very, very rarely look at the important ones to me is what does your high school coach say about you? Um, and then obviously there's physical attributes that have to, that have to come along to as well. I mean, um, you know, I mean, heart and, and, uh, effort and all those, um, those aren't measurables. You can see those on tape though, and you can see how hard a kid plays. You can, you can see, you know, his effort. Um, on plays that he doesn't make, um, you know, on the tape. So those are all qualities that we look at. But, you know, one of the main one is, is, is he the hardest player that you have? 
you know, coach, is is he going to be the hardest worker that you have? What's his um, summer program look like as far as his attendance? How is his academics? And then when I show up to the school to get transcripts and talk um, about the academic side of things, the first thing I do is I just walk in down the hallway and I'll uh, I'll stop some girl in the hallway. And it could be a teacher. It could be a student and say, hey, do you know Billy Joe? And yeah, I know Billy Joe. What do you think about him? And I'm not looking, listening for her response. I'm looking for her reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll ask secretaries. I'll ask students. Um, you know, I'll ask janitors. Um, you because know, co the coach sees them in one aspect, but what they do on campus is seen by another aspect. And I have stopped recruiting a kid before because of the response I got from a secretary. Um, so I think it's real important to do that. But, you know, looking at recruiting as a as a cycle, it's it's an ongoing process that continue that's really starts at this point of the year where we're contacting coaches. Hey, will you please get me your, you know, uh, your 2021 um, recruiting class? And uh, I need all their vitals, their statistic sheets, that type of stuff. And then you take a look at those kids and then you watch their videos and then you give them grades and those grades go on to from the area coach, because we recruit as an area. I don't just recruit a position. I recruit an area and it may be offensive line quarterbacks, the whole nine yards. Then that will go to the position coach. The position coach gives them a grade. If it is high enough, then it goes to the coordinator. If the coordinator gives them a grade that's high enough, then it goes to the head coach and the head coach will make the determination whether or not this kid's an early offer at this point. Mm -hmm. Now an early offer right now, you know, is is important. But at the same time, um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to offer other kids later on down the road, too, as well. So it it's more of a marathon and less of a sprint. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, depending on what happens with the NCAA, depending on what happens this summer, um, camp seasons are important too to get the kids on campus, see them move in person. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a recruit that's want to get recruited, get to camps if camps are allowed this summer. You know, get on campus, let these coaches evaluate you, let these coaches see you, let these coaches coach you, because it's not just the kid that's being evaluated, it's the coach that's being evaluated by the kid and the family too as well. Yep. So not it's every relationship, right? That's right. Well, not every kid will like the way that I coach, mm -hmm. you know, and if they don't, then I don't need them here either mm -hmm. because there's it's not gonna it's not gonna mesh. Um, I would like to say that every Every kid would love me. Um, I hope they do. But at the same time, you know, I got a job to do, and that's to help them get better as a football player, better as a person, better as a student. But, you know, sometimes those are hard. Those are hard conversations. that you have. I mean, I had to have one this morning with a kid um, about the way he's acting. He's on campus right now. I had to have a conversation with him the way, the way he's acting in the dorms. Those are hard conversations. Don't I don't think he probably likes me right now. In an hour, he'll love me again, but you know, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Do you, how do you find these players in the first place? Is it that they come to your camps or through connections, networking? Do you have a specific strategy to find them? Right. We've got uh, a database of all the coaches in our area. Okay. We contact those coaches and those coaches then send us our, their prospect sheets. All right. So every one of their seniors are on their prospect sheets. And then we identify the area of needs that we have. I mean, certain recruiting cycles, you may sign one running back. Well, you may have 26 running backs on the board. Not all of those running backs are going to be at the University of Central Oklahoma. The chances are maybe one of them will be, you know. So you got to identify the guys that you're looking for. And, you know, and that's one thing that's difficult with coaches sometimes is, They'll call me and they're they like, hey, coach, you got to take this kid. Well, buddy, I'm only taking two linebackers this cycle. Mm -hmm. you know, well, he's the best kid I've coached in 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I've got two that I think that are a little bit better right now, you know, and those are hard conversations to have, too, as well. So it's always about, you know, relationships, relationships with the coach to get them to trust you that you're doing the best for your program. And, you know, they they've got to understand that too as well. And so I think if you're open with everybody, you're constantly telling them what the process is. Um, you know, obviously you want to hold your cards 
close to your chest on some of those. But, you know, you you got to be as open as you can be with families, coaches, and obviously the athlete themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, last question for me, unless anyone else has one. But, you know, looking for – I mean, these are these are designed to help coaches who are trying to improve, but also those who are interested in becoming a coach or early career coaches. And so one of the questions I always ask is kind of what advice do, would you give to somebody who's interested in, in kind of progressing in their coaching career or getting into coaching? All right. So <clears throat> coaching has been, you know, it's highly fantasized. It's It's highly, you know, I mean, you see the game day, you see the money that, you know, Nick Saban and some of these guys make and and everybody wants to say, yeah, I want to be a, a football coach or I want to be a coach. I want a game day. I want, you know, 80,000 people in the stands watching me coach. And I want, you know, another two million on TV to watch me coach. But here's my advice. All right. Is if you're getting in it for that, you don't need to get in it. And if there's something else that you can do and you can be extremely happy doing it, do that instead of coaching. All right. Now it sounds like I'm saying don't coach. If you love it and there's nothing else that you want to do, that's what you need to do. You need to coach. But if there's something else that you could find joy and, and be able to spend time with your family, be able to, and and I'm going to tell you why in a second, be able to spend time with your family, be able to make sure that you're mentally health healthy and, and that type of stuff, then, then do that job instead. Um, the reason why is you see all the positives about coaching, but there's a very dark side mm. to coaching too, as well. Um, and like with a lot of jobs, I mean, it's, it, you, it's performance based. What you do now, it, it didn't have anything to do with what you've, what you've done in the past. I mean, my alma mater, my first job I've ever had in 2003, we finished the season 10th in the nation um, in division two football. In 2004, I'm looking at the end of that season. I'm looking for a new job. Mm -hmm. So it has nothing to do with what you've done for the program, how many years you've done it for the program. Um, If you're not successful this year, if you're not successful now, if you're not successful in the last ball game, it may cost you your job. You know, and friends that you thought you had when you have a job are not always the same friends that are there for you when you don't have a job. so it can be a fickle um, profession, a mm-hmm. difficult profession, and it's a highly competitive. I mean, think about the number of coaches that are coming out every year. Yeah. Every one of them want my job, yeah. you know. So if you're not motivated by that, then you can't be motivated, you know. So um, every, you know, there, there's there's only a limited number of college jobs out there. There's a limited number of high school jobs out there. Um and if you get up every day going, ah, oh, I don't know if I will feel like going in. Well, guess what? There's some young kid out there that's dreaming about it. And uh, you better outwork him or you're going to get replaced. Mm-hmm. You said you, a follow up question. You, you said there was a dark side to coaching. You know, there's the glamour, there's the money, there's the notoriety and all that. Um, and I think you've touched on it and, you know, long hours, high stress, um, pressure all these things come with it. And so what you, you said is, is very clear, unless this is something that you're, you know, absolutely a hundred percent committed to don't do it because it's, it's not going to, you're, you're not going to fare well. Yeah. It, it's, uh, well, you see it. I mean, there are coaches that get out of coaching and, and you see it on, you know, some of the coaching websites out there. So-and-so getting out of coaching, going into private business. You know, um, if you ask that coach, if you know that coach and there's a couple of them I have known, man, I'm just coach. I'm just burned out. You know, my one of my one of my really good friends just got out of coaching recently. Um, he, he said this. He goes, I have never taken my kids to school. Do you know that coach? And I'm like, no. And he goes, I've never done it. I've never coached one of my own kids. Mm. Um, so I, I need to get out and do something else. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's a big sacrifice that your family's going to make and, um, you know, whatever special person you bring into your life um, for, you know, possible marriage or dating or whatever. Um, before you 
tie the knot with them, they need to go through a season of what it is that you actually do before, because I mean, it is, uh, it, you my wife is a single mother, you know, six months out of a year. I mean, it, it, it is. So, um, it's a great profession. Uh, I love it or I wouldn't be doing it. Um, but it needs to be clear. And, and, and I have these interviews with kids on campus, they'll come in and, you know, for their coaching class and ask They'll ask that very same question. My my answer is always the same. If there's anything you can do besides this to be happy at, then then do it. Don't coach. If this is all you want to do and you've got the right reasons and you've got a why behind it, then do this because you're meant to do it. Mm. Um, but don't go chasing the money. Don't go chasing the um, – I mean, heck, I'm 44 years old and still an assistant Division two coach. I ain't at Florida. I ain't Florida. You've, been successful, though. You've been successful though. Don't don't uh, don't make it sound like this is a necessarily a bad thing. You, you've 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 won some some titles and you've gone to some bowl games. So uh, we, we should we should clarify that a little bit. Right, right. Well, I just want to make sure that people are like, well, I'm going to go to Alabama. I mean, I'm going to yeah. be the next Nick Saban. I'm going to go to right. Florida State. You know, um, um, you be you 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 know. One of my dad's sayings when I was growing up is he would always say this to me. He'd say, hey, the big time is where you're at and you need to treat it that way. And that's what I've done my whole career is mm-hmm. wherever I'm at. It's the it's the place you want to be, you know, because um, we're going to take pride in what it is that we do. Um, we're going to do it with extreme enthusiasm. We're going to do it with extreme effort. Um, every day is its own day. What you did yesterday doesn't mean much for today. Um, don't worry about tomorrow. Let's just handle today. And I think if you do that, you're going to find success. And success is different than what some people see it see it as. They, how much money do you make? What is your job title? So on and so forth. Um, there's emails and text messages and Facebook messages that I've gotten from former players that coach, I appreciate what you've done. And sometimes I read those and I've even taken them into my wife and shown them to her and be crying and go, this kid right here of all the kids, I never thought I'd hear from him. I mean, like the things I said, the things I did, you know, how, how I treated this kid and yet he's gracious, you know, but I met him where he was at at the time and gave him what he needed at the time, you know, and, um, you know, that's what it's about. It's about it's about helping others. At the end of the day, that's what we do is it's not about winning football games, even though administrators and others will put boosters and all that will put so much emphasis on that. It's about building relationships and it's about teaching someone how to be a better person, you know, how to be a man or a woman. Um, and, uh, you know, I think. I think it's some of the best stuff. I mean, like there's nothing else I, I want to do. I've thought about it before. Like, man, this is so stressful. Maybe I should get out of coaching. There's other things I could do, but there's nothing I want to do, you know, and I've been fired before and sitting at home going, all right, where's the next job? Maybe this is God's way of telling me to go find something else to do, but God, there's nothing else I want to do, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think that's a vital part of, finding out whether or not you're a coach, you're, you're, you want to be a coach mm-hmm. is, is there anything else I want to do? And if there's not, then let's do this and put all your eggs in that basket and, and, and make it happen. And because you're going to be successful, but if there's something else that you could do and be happy at, and you just jump in half heartedly, this profession will beat you down. It, it will get the best of you. If, if anyone wants to kind of follow up with questions or, or follow you, I, I know you, you do some social media. What's the best way for them to do that? Um, well, they can get a hold of my email. My email is J S M E L S E R at UCO.edu. And follow me on Twitter, uh, Coach Smelser. Um, I don't have I don't have my Facebook open. I've got a Facebook account, but it's not. I closed it in January just to get away from some social media. 
And then you can find me on LinkedIn, I believe. And it, I can't even remember. Is that Jay Smelser? I can't even remember what my LinkedIn it is. It pops up. It's not too, it's a pretty unique name. Um, uh, and uh, you post a lot of videos of what you do in the gym and, and with, with your athletes. And I always enjoy watching them uh, as well. So, Coach, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to talk to us. And um, again, if anyone has questions, I, I hope they reach out. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you.